Here we are at the service to the railway station. 440 kilometres that way is Melbourne, and 293 kilometres that way is Adelaide. Just over there is the South Australian Victorian border. The station was opened in 1889 and is made of over 2,000 tonne of bricks from Horsham. On the 19th of January 1887, that the Intercolonial Express train left Adelaide bound for Melbourne. And the Intercolonial Express train also left Melbourne bound for Adelaide. The two trains crossed at Gimboa. This was the very first time that Victoria and South Australia had been linked with a regular passenger train service. 133 years later, and the Melbourne to Adelaide passenger rail service, now known as the Overland, is about to be closed. So welcome to the Service and Summit, an opportunity to have a discussion about how and why the Overland passenger train should keep running. Today we have representation from both sides of the border. We acknowledge the traditional owners of this land, and we pay our respects to their elders, both past and present, and commit to working together in the spirit of mutual understanding and respect for the broader community and future generations. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name's Councillor Mark Radford, the Mayor of Horsham Rural City, and welcome to our service and summit. And uh, it's lovely to see we've got quite a few people listening in, which is fantastic. And uh, we've got a, our panellists in front of us here, which is great. Um, I've got to say that it's all come together pretty well in a short space of time. Um, most of us have never met each other before other than uh, by email over the last few weeks. And uh, the original idea, was, uh, as the name would suggest, is that we might have a bit of a cross-border gathering um, at the Serviston Railway Station. And uh, in the beautiful old dining room at a big table and maybe a, a red line down the middle, but uh, that isn't to be because of the restrictions. So we've moved to plan B and, uh, and, and doing it uh, in a virtual way. Uh, so we'll see how it goes and uh, we're looking forward to today. It's important to realise that um, uh, it's an interactive session, so there will be opportunity later to ask some questions of our panellists. Um, there's an opportunity for each one of our panellists panellists to say a few words, do a little presentation. I'll introduce our panel. So welcome to Margaret Millington from NIL in Victoria. We have uh, John Wilson from Adelaide in South Australia. Councillor Matt O'Brien is from Murray Bridge in South Australia. Um, Tony Zappier is an MP from Member for Macon in South Australia. The Honourable Claire Scriven, uh, Member for the Legislative Council from South Australia has joined us as has Professor Philip Laird from the University of Wollongong in New South Wales. And also we've got Sean, Wayne, Sean Wales from ABC Radio listening in as well. So that's our panel. And we've got an extra guest, um, which is Mr Mike Hinch, a former train driver. And so we might be hearing from Mike a little bit later on as well. So the purpose of today's summit is to discuss how and why the overland passenger train should keep running. As of today, the funded commitment from the Victorian State Government will expire on the 30th of June, Wednesday week, and the train will not run again. So the spirit of today's discussion is to look forward with a positive attitude and, as community members, offer to assist. So to kick us off, I'm going to invite Mr John Wilson, who's a rail historian and author of the book the Overland Social History and Historical Perspective uh, to present a few thoughts. And uh, we've got some photographs to show as John is speaking. So welcome, John. Thank you, Mark. From what I can read, the Indigenous people of Australia lived in harmony with the land without the need for territorial markers. I can understand that they may regard this gathering as silly white fellas bickering about a line in the sand. This imaginary line on the map has been a source of grief for both South Australia and Victoria almost since it was surveyed back in 1847. It has generated 173 years of intercolonial squabbling. 
I'm passionate about the overland, its past and its future, but I'm not sure about the present. It is not a happy place. I'm passionate about history. The history of the overland is one of 133 years of intercolonial squabbling. In 2018, it looked like the Express was about to pass into history. It had a story to tell and I was determined to tell it. On page four of my book, I've stated, this is the exciting stuff about history. It explains the here and now and it has relevance for the future. That squabbling has persisted to this day and has been responsible more than anything else for the present unhappy lot of a once great train. The two colonies of Victoria and South Australia did not have a harmonious existence. In fact, this very line that separates us today was one of the blights that soured that intercolonial relationship. But in 1885, the premiers of South Australia, John Downer and Victoria, Jane Service, were passionate about federation and able to rise above the squabbling and set about construction of the last section of the Intercolonial Railway. They gave us the Intercolonial Express, which I believe was unique in the world, being jointly owned and operated by two jurisdictions. That was the origin of the Overland and they agreed to a border station. Here it is. Down the track a little, not quite on the border, it needed a name. Downer suggested it be named after service. He accepted the honour, noting that it pleased him that his name would be associated with the coming together of the two colonies. Serviston Station is a shrine of Australian Federation. By late 1886, the railway was near complete, but the station wasn't. The South Australian Governor, His Excellency Sir William Robinson, was desirous of attending the Melbourne Cup. A special train was provided along with one of the new boudoir cars. Yes, they were called boudoir cars. That special train was effectively a trial run of the express. This would have made Sir William the first traveller to cross the border aboard a through sleeping car train. But it was not to be. There was another traveller who came aboard and like Sir William had done so without purchasing a ticket. He was, he was Bob the railway dog. Bob always rode in the engine tender. I leave it to you to decide if Bob was the first traveller to ride the express. Meanwhile, there had been a change of government in Victoria and a return to the old order of intercolonial squabbling. The departure of the first intercolonial express was the first time that two Australian capitals were directly linked by rail. It should have been celebrated with a brass band and a champagne event, but the two colonies could only agree that they couldn't agree. The two expresses departed without ceremony from their respective capitals on the afternoon of the 19th of January 1887, crossed quietly in the night at Dimboola and arrived at their destination since the next morning. John Downer was the sole presence of South Australian officialdom waiting on the Adelaide platform to welcome the first express into Adelaide. Mayor Radford in initial correspondence stated that there needed to be a thorough examination of the future of the Overland, which would need three-way support from the two state governments and the operator of the Overland. I add that there is a fourth, the Commonwealth. It has some ownership of the problem and the solution. A few facts. The carriages were jointly owned by the two colonies in proportion to the mileages of the respective jurisdictions. In the steam era, the engines were changed at service fee. Now those percentages were 59.25% for Victoria and 40.75% for South Australia. In its 133 years, it has never had a passenger fatality relating to passengers who were properly contained in their carriages. But it has had a few scrapes, most notable was the head-on collision of both Overland Express trains at Serviston in 1951. The Overland name was coined in 1926 by Victorian Chairman of the Railways Commissioners, Harold Clapp. It took another nine years for South Australia to agree. Diesels were used from 1951 in South Australia and from 1952 in Victoria. It became totally owned and operated by the Australian National Railways Commission 
by Commonwealth Instrumentality in 1994. The Adelaide to Melbourne railway was converted to standard gauge in 1995. The standard gauge route was via Cressy and was considerably longer. It was privatised in 1997. The longest overland was in 2002 when the Adelaide Crows were in the grand final, 32 carriages. My previous book was a history of that compulsive train traveller Bob the Railway Dog. It was launched in the National Railway Museum in May last year. The plan had been for it to be launched by another compulsive train traveller, former Deputy Prime Minister and patron of the National Railway Museum, the late Honourable Tim Fisher. Tim was in poor health and there was doubt about whether he would be able to attend. A few days before the event, Tim phoned and in his usual cheery tone, go to the bad news and the good news. Now I'm going to change tracks here. I'm going to tell you Tim's good news and bad news after which I beg 15 seconds total silence during which we can reflect on the life of a great advocate for rail. Tim was a politician who was able to transcend the dividing lines of party politics. During those 15 seconds, I ask you to contemplate what Tim would have to say if he was here. Mayor Radford will take the floor at the end of the 15 seconds. The bad news. His specialists had declared him unfit to fly. And the good news, I'm booked on the overland. John, it's a great story, mate. Thank you. Well done. Um, now I'm going to invite Mrs. Margaret Millington, who is a passionate user and supporter of the Overland from Western Victoria, to share her thoughts. Um, we weren't sure if Margaret was going to be able to be with us today, so it was actually recorded a little video, um, and it's called A Community Perspective. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk today about an issue that's really close to my heart. There is no doubt we are living in unprecedented times, certainly times never experienced by my generation. We have never suffered war or conflict on our land. Most of us have never had to go without. We are living in the lucky country thanks to previous generations of brave men and women who fought for our freedom. And yet, here we are, unexpectedly, fighting an unknown enemy, a virus. Many have said life has changed things will never be the same again. This may be our new norm. Having said that, I have never been one not to fight for what I believe in. And that, my friends, is why I have invested so much time and energy into saving the overland. Train travel between Melbourne and Adelaide is an absolute joy. It is a journey that takes us through some of Australia's unique towns and countryside, including the Grampians, Ararat, Nil, Murray Bridge, to name but a few. But all part of its heartland and history. It must continue. Whilst I applaud the Victorian State Government for its vision in funding the train to this point, I hope South Australia can also see the wisdom of doing so. This week, governments at all levels are encouraging us to holiday within Australia. Why stop the overland then and spend so much on a rail link between Melbourne and Brisbane? It doesn't really make sense to me. My first experience of the Overland was in 1983 at about 2am in the morning. I was asked to meet the train and pick up a young girl and take her home. She was blind. Her mother was also visually impaired and unable to meet her. I did this for that family often over many years. I realised then the importance and the need of the train, even back then, especially for those with a disability. Throughout the following 37 years, the importance of the treasured train has become even more apparent and personal to me. Being in my senior years now, I too, like my 96-year-old dad and many in our age group, are regular travellers on the train. Despite being an able-bodied person at this stage, it is my preferred means of travel. You may ask why. Firstly, we are not competing with the hundreds of semis now using this route to move freight so it is safer. I recently read a report stating one full train can carry more than 600 to intake 600 cars off the road. 
Thus, the environmental argument also becomes relevant. Secondly, it is a one-stop shop. Once you're on, you're on until you reach your destination. The last time I travelled from Neil to Melbourne, I had to catch three different buses. The trip took six and a half hours. There was no option to walk around, buy a drink or use appropriate bathroom facilities. And, despite this being such a long journey, the seating was not as comfortable as that on the train. Imagine being disabled or elderly. Certainly not the ideal option. For the past, past three months or so, we all know what it's like to go without. To go without family, company and even travel. I have missed my overland experiences. I have missed going to Melbourne or Adelaide. I cannot bear to think it has now reached the end of the line, so to speak, and been written off as part of our rail history. Cruises and flights are certainly less attractive travel options following the pandemic. The train makes most sense and provides a safe, relaxing way for all age groups to see this vast land rather than to simply fly over it. Let's make the most of this moment and instead of farewelling the train for good, let's look at positive ways we can reinvent it and make it an exciting part of the post-virus times. I urge all actively involved or viewing this summit to continue to support and fight for the future of this iconic train. We have reached a defining moment in history. Let it be that, due to popular demand and a public outcry, that this train service, which has been running since 1887, will continue bigger and better than ever. Please give us the chance to share this part of history with our grandies, as a let's go on the overland moment rather than once upon a time, there used to be a train called the Overland. We live in hope. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now Councillor Matt O'Brien is uh, at the Murray Bridge Station broadcasting live. <laughs> so, um, Matt, you're going to share some thoughts about uh, how the service could be improved. Over to you, mate. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, your worship, the Mayor of the Horsham Rural City, Mike Radford, and you've been a driving force behind this occasion, and I thank you for that. Um, and also the Honourable Tony Zappia MP, uh, the Honourable Claire Spriven MLC, who's, who's next to me here in Murray Bridge. Um, my fellow elected members and representatives from local government, John Wilson, author and historian and tireless advocate, uh, Margaret Millington OAM, and another great advocate, and all invited panellists and viewers. Um, well, it's been an interesting week in South Australian-Victorian relations, and we know that. Um, and on this side of the border, we're very proud people, and, and so are Victoria, and that's a good thing. Um, but we have no trouble defending our great state against the mostly good nature, nature dispersions of our cross-border friends, um, even if they flow a little bit freely at times. But the truth is our Victorian friends here today know the value of our connection to the overland and having a service that provides for their state and ours. Many Victorians love South Australia, and many South Australians love nothing more than a getaway to Victoria, particularly if it involves watching the Crows beat any Victorian side, but <laughs> we're probably not, we're not gonna see that for a bit, so we won't worry about that. And, and so while we're here to support the Overland and its current predicament, despite its great reputation, um, few would argue that some change is necessary to ensure a viable service that continues on its proud history while building its next chapter in the history books, hopefully written by Mr. John Wilson himself at a later point. So with disclosure, my knowledge is not akin to the likes of Mr. Wilson and others joining us today. But in my opinion, there are some key questions we could all ask ourselves that may help us uncover a viable path forward. And, and this is no, by, no means a definitive list, but it reflects some of the public sentiment I've seen. Can we make the train easier to catch and a more user-friendly experience? This could be achieved with more options to catch the train from other locations, partnered with bus services to link people to those locations. For example, a bus service via the O'Barn to Murray Bridge with pickup in Burnside and Mount Barker. This model could be replicated on both sides of the border where there is demand to do so. Modernisation of carriages and equipment, adding USB ports and Wi-Fi, offering more family-friendly activities and making it an even better experience than it already is for kids and families would, already, would all be great. So what can we add to the experience? The Overland's already known for its comfortable journey, journey, friendly staff, affordable food and clean facilities on top of the magnificent scenery. It would be a, it'd be beneficial for all if the Overland became more intertwined with the towns and cities it travels through 
and partnerships made with tourism operators and key attractions in the regions that travellers could experience before or after catching the train. Not only could it add to the Oberland itself, but it could further help places like Murray Bridge um, and, and those on the Victorian side bring in more tourism, which is so vital to our economy. Uh, thinking outside the square, uh, a rail enthusiast journey or something of the like throughout the year alongside the regular timetable, seeing the Overland make stops at key locations. And of course, I say one of those is Murray Bridge. And of course, that it is. Um, but also, uh, most definitely places like Serviston, where tours of the station could be conducted and lunch, dinner served, making an experience dedicated to the history of the service. And there are a lot of people that love the service. Let's not mistake that. Uh, overnight services, just like the old days, appear to have some supporters for nostalgic and practical reasons. Um, and another step forward would be adding more flexibility to the travelling times by adding extra services. Um, so how do we get more people on this beloved train? The Overland does so much right already. On TripAdvisor.com, the Overland scores a massive 87% of customers who said it was excellent or very good. Comments abound about the friendly service, spacious seating, ability to move around, affordable food, the ability for older folk and those with disabilities to travel in comfort and families who just love making the trip. To get more people travelling this way, we need to get the message out to people, not only the footy public who know it's a great way to catch a game interstate, but to anyone who wants to travel in comfort between Adelaide and Melbourne. We know it keeps cars off the highway where too many tragedies have happened. We know it provides invaluable service to people with disability, older travellers and young families and people who can't or don't like flying or driving amongst so many others. It provides a particularly valuable service to the regions that passes through, including Murray Bridge and the Wimmera region of Victoria. Importantly, in this current economic climate, once borders reopen, it brings tourism into both states, which is exactly what we, we all need, despite what I assume is the good-natured ribbing that has occurred in the past week. Uh, so yes, the Overland does need some form of government assistance at this point to keep it going. But the trade-off for that small amount of assistance is tourism, jobs and preserving history. It's not about being seen to prioritise road over rail, as some may accuse the SA government of doing. It's about finding a balance that provides for as much of the public as possible. And we know the benefits to the people who love this train and those who get to love it if they get a chance to hop on. Um, and, and we hope that it becomes, once again, a mainstay of interstate travel in Australia. Um, I'd like to close by once again thanking Mayor Radford, uh, John and Margaret for making this event happen and their passion for the cause, which has become infectious. I'm proud that we've made this happen and that we could work across the border for the right outcome. Good on you, Matt. Okay, thanks, mate. Thanks for your comments there. I'd now like to invite uh, Professor Philip Laird uh, to share a few thoughts about the train. Philip. Thank you very much uh, and to the City of Horsham for hosting the uh, this session. Look, three things. This train spans three centuries of service. Secondly, uh, it's old, but it, it's reliable and moves people well. And re relative comfort, particularly compared with a bus, um, and also, I'd suggest being cramped in a 737 plane. Uh, thirdly, there's scope for track upgrades. Uh, firstly, on the eastern slopes of the Adelaide Hills, uh, with some grade easing and curve easing, this would probably pay for itself over time and making it easier for the westbound freight trains from Melbourne to Perth. Uh, secondly, near Horsham, I, I think there's a dog leg. John Wilson could explain in more detail. Um, now, hopefully it'll be reinstated this winter, but if not, keep at it because it, there's a precedent for, you know, trains operating more in summer than they do in winter. And um, don't let it go, even if it's not reinstated this year. The Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand knocked out the Trans-Pacific train for two years, but they did bring it back. And it's only a short train to begin with, but it did come back. And this is our challenge. If we can't get it this winter, then secondly this year, and if we can't get it this year, then next year. And I think there's a role for the Commonwealth here as well as... Uh, 
the government of South Australia, which has been exemplary in some ways in the past, uh, in its travel support of, you know, extending the Adelaide tram system, for one thing, uh, electrifying its suburban railways by 2014, but it really should reconsider. And the amount of money is not much. I mean, last year, I think the contribution sought from the government of Australia was 300,000. Well, that should, that or even three times that would be reasonable from the government of South Australia. Okay. Finally, so, let's try and yeah. get it for three years at least rather than just one year. Okay. Thank you. All right. Good on you, Philip. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Tony Zapier, if you'd like to uh, share some thoughts with us, please. Yeah, thank you, Mark. And uh, thank you to the City of Horsham for both organising and hosting us today. And uh, thank you also to all of the other panel members um, and the ABC and others who are going to join this summit. Can I say thank you to the speakers who have just spoken because I think all of them have contributed to justifying why the overland needs to continue. And from a personal perspective, um, my view is that it would be indeed a very sad day for Australia if the overland was disconnected. Um, particularly at a time that we see the federal government and other states investing in railways across the country. And indeed, railway investments seem to be very much on the national agenda right now, at the same time that we're seeing the overland possibly come to an end. And I have to say, when I look back at the history of this in more recent years, it has been, um, I think, um, partly a problem in as much as firstly, the federal government cuts funding to um, pensioners and other uh, welfare card holders with respect to um, uh, train travel and so on, and that I think would have made some difference. We've also seen the service itself begin to deteriorate, and that in turn makes it less attractive for people. Um, and there's also been a lack of investment in the railway system in its own right. And so there's been several reasons why we've reached the point we have, but the real issue here is that we need to keep the overland going. We need to keep it going because it's a major connector between Adelaide and Melbourne. And one of the things that we should have as a nation is railway connections between each of the capital cities. Secondly, in terms of, um, um, of need, I think it adds to our security across the country. Um, and we see that with COVID-19 when um, other transport um, systems start to close down. It's always useful to have backups. But more importantly, of all of those three, is that railway, in my view, adds substantially to the economies of our country and the, the towns that we've heard, heard of along the way, such as whether it's Murray Bridge, Horsham and other country towns. And so there is an, an economic value in retaining the service. It's somewhat of a pity that we can't quantify that and it would be very useful if we were able at some stage to get some study made as to just how much value it does bring to the Australian economy in that in that respect. And then of course there's also the social value that uh, it brings by keeping com communities connected and particularly the rural and regional communities. Lastly can I say this and John Wilson has spoken about this on many occasions. It seems to me that if the track and the system was upgraded, that it could become viable once again. And I see no reason why that shouldn't go ahead. But again, I don't know if anyone has taken the time to do some proper costings of what that would be. I know Edward Michelle, and there was an article here in South Australia in one of the in, in Daly not long ago, where he suggested that for $50 million, the service could be upgraded to a point where the time taken for the trains to travel between Adelaide and Melbourne would be significantly reduced and in turn make the whole um, system much more viable. Now, I don't know if that was ever costed. It ought to be. And if that proposal uh, isn't the one we should be backing, I'm sure that there is ways of upgrading the railway system so that it does return to, be, to being a viable 
a viable connection point. Uh, we appreciate that. Thank you very much. Uh, Claire, over to you for some sharing some thoughts, please. Okay, well, thank you, um, Mark, and thank you to everyone who's been involved in organising this, and more importantly, to everyone who is trying to ensure that the overland does continue. Uh, I would echo some of the thoughts that um, Tony Zapier, Federal MP, has talked about in terms of linking the capital cities. Uh, but also, uh, I'm a regional resident, and the importance to the regional communities must not be overlooked and can't be overstated. Um, in regional areas like Murray Bridge, where I'm here with uh, Matt today, but also um, Border Town, for example, on my side of the border, uh, the Overland is one of the few public transport options that is available to re regional residents at all. And history shows that once we lose services in regions, it's very unlikely that we get them back. So there's a really important reason to, for the Overland to be kept from that perspective. Um, the other one is, of course, for people with a disability who can't use other forms of transport easily. Uh, and uh, again, it's a very important option that people with a disability need to have. Um, tourism, of course, is another one. My uh, daughter and son-in-law travelled from uh, Adelaide to Melbourne on the Overland uh, about a year ago. Uh, they've now got a little baby and the idea of actually being able to travel uh, in comfort where you can walk around and move around, do what you need to do with family, uh, particularly with small children, uh, is something that really only train can offer. So uh, the tourism aspects for young families, I think, could certainly be promoted more. And we need to make sure that uh, all of those options continue to be available. Uh, it is only a small amount of money that the South Australian government uh, was putting in each year. So under the previous Labor government, uh, as one of the previous speakers mentioned, roughly $300,000 a year, uh, which the Labor opposition, which I'm a member of, is uh, certainly willing to commit to if we are returned to government in two years' time. But it's important that we don't lose it. We don't lose it. We need to keep the pressure up uh, so that we actually get to retain this service uh, and we don't lose it because if, it, if we do lose it, it's very hard to get it back. Okay, thank you, Claire. And, uh, so, Mike, can you introduce yourself? That's probably the best shot. Okay, is my audio okay? It is, it is, and we've, we've, you've got two and a half minutes, mate. <laughs> All right, um, look, I'll be, I'll, 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 in the interest of brevity, I, I'm a retired train driver. I drove the Overland many times. I retired recently from V-Line as an instructor. Now, um, uh, the Western Corridor, uh, you've discussed how the upgrades are required. That's a governmental issue, but I understand that this forum is really about being positive and trying to keep the service going. But you need to have a devil's advocate. And, I'm, and, and I don't want to be a wet blanket, but you need to consider logistics and realities. And I am a staunch advocate of keeping a rail service open between Melbourne and Adelaide. It is a vital link and it must not be severed. Having said that, you must consider the future of the overland. Would you continue with the classic uh, rolling stock, as they refer to it, which is locomotive hauled, and the classic rolling stock that they currently use? Or would you, in future, move to a self-propelled uh, rail vehicle, such as a Velocity or the XPT style of vehicle? If that's the case, then there's a whole new world of design, engineering, and maintenance. Maintenance is everything. Now, under the current regime, if it is to continue, you have to decide which company or entity uh, is engaged in the hook and pull of the service. Currently, it's Pacific National. Now, for them, and I don't wish to denigrate, uh, they currently use the service uh, in two respects. One, uh, as a cost-efficient means of moving crews back and forth to all to Gimboola from both Melbourne and Adelaide. And of course, it's a little bit of a flag waiver. Now, uh, if you were to choose another hook and pull carrier, the only other obvious uh, candidate would be V-Line. If that were the case, then they, they will have the rolling stock in terms of locomotives uh, becoming available as more velocities enter the system into Victoria. And we used to run them with the N-class locomotives, and I drove that many, many times. Uh, but then there has to be considered maintenance at each end of the service and the logistics involved in providing that maintenance. Um, if the 
Pacific National Company continues to be the hook and pull candidate, then there isn't much of a question. Uh, they just continue to do what they're doing. Funding, of course, from the government is all important, but the logistical concerns must be considered. So thank you for mentioning that side of it, the trains and the track side of it. And so we're gonna keep moving and I'd like to share some thoughts about the tourism opportunities. Okay, so linking our wide brown land with a network of passenger trains makes sense. Around the world, the rail journey experience is very popular. The unexplored tourism opportunities for the overland should be investigated. And towns along the line could benefit by attracting visitors for short stay holidays. Next one, please. And this is a bit of an example using the existing Horsham to Overland timetable. So here's a package that would work. 805 leaves Melbourne. You arrive at Horsham at 12.30 in the afternoon on Tuesday. Enjoy the time in and around visiting the Silo Art Trail. Wednesday, Thursday, a, Gramp a Grampians trip back on the train at 17 past two on at Horsham and to arrive back in Melbourne at 6.50 on Friday. Well, another one that includes three nights accommodation and uh, an also hire car. The other package is from the other end. So Friday, leaving Adelaide in the morning, arriving at Horsham in the afternoon. Once again, the Silo Art Trail, which is a great drive for our South Australian visitors tuned in today, um, in and around the beautiful Grand Pins National Park. And then on Monday, the opportunity to visit our local wineries and out to Manorapolis. Uh, back on the train on Tuesday lunchtime into Adelaide, arriving at 40, uh, 5.40. You can see there, that'll be four nights accommodation in Horsham with a, with a high car. And the interesting thing about this proposal is that uh, this, this has never happened before. No one's ever thought of this, thought about doing this before. And uh, we met up with the CEO of Grampians Tourism uh, this week and we had this discussion. And, and why not? Why couldn't every town along the line who has accommodation and hire cars available offer a similar thing? It's a great question to ask from a tourism point of view. Okay, we'll keep going, Brody, which leads us today to the two proposals for discussion. And Matt, if you can, uh, if you can see the screen, I'd like you to read out number one for us, please. Right, number one, um, that we advocate for the service to continue for at least six months. During this time, governments and Journey Beyond, with participation from supporters along the line, work together to formulate a new strategic plan to ensure the train's long-term future. Our um, call to action is writing respectful letters of support to government. Okay, and the second one, please, Brody. The second one, uh, Margaret, could you read that for us, please? Um, that if the service continues, we will commence a Friends of the Overland train, uh, train group to assist with the promotion of the service and provide community input to the train operator. And the call to action is to invite members of the community to join the Friends of the Overland train um, of the, on Facebook. So there are our um, two proposals to move forward, if you like. And, uh, and, and the first one does pick up what, uh, what Mike was saying, is that if we could at least keep it, get the train going for a short time and then have, have a serious look at, at the long-term future and uh, exploring new ways for it, looking at those tracks and uh, the, life, uh, the, um, the trains and all those other infrastructure things in the long term. But it, it can at least have some breathing space uh, to do that sort of planning. And so what we're suggesting today, we're encouraging people to listening to us today um, and also we'll be viewing later on, um, to keep on writing letters of support, respectful letters of support uh, to members of government um, in the hope that the service may continue. Uh, and the second thing we'd like to do uh, is, is establish a, a network of like, uh, if you like, a network of people who have an interest in the service to keep in touch mm. and, and also to offer to help promote the service. And uh, one of the things that I think we've all agreed in our um, discussions leading up to today was that the service really needs a bit of a hand with its promotion. And that's where the, uh, the stations along the line, the residents along the line, the communities along the line can work together and offer their services to help promote the train. And, and our example in Horsham, I, I can't go to our visitor centre um, and pick up a timetable or a brochure. They just, they just aren't available. And I, and I understand that's, that's a similar issue along the line. So I think that's, that's something we can do as a group 
um, and uh, to, to get together and form a group, the Friends of the Overland. And so I'd encourage people who are up on the Facebook uh, to, uh, if, the, if the train does have the opportunity to continue, we'll find that out in a few days' time, I'd imagine, as the end of the end of the June draws closer, then we will actually set up this uh, Facebook site as a way of communicating and, and working together. I'd like to invite Sean Wales, who's from the ABC. Sean, would you like to ask any questions of any of the panellists? Can you hear me there, Mark? Yes, we can, Sean. My main, my first question really um, leading on for this promotion stuff you're talking about is, I get um, why you're pushing for it, but isn't it really Journey Beyond's responsibility to be you know, putting this out there and, and advertising it properly? It's an independently commercially run train. Why isn't the company doing this already? Okay, that's a good question. So, Margaret, would you like to comment about um, why, why, if it is important for us to get behind with the promotions? A lot of people are unaware of um, what the train does offer, where it stops and what's available at each stop. So I, I definitely agree that um, it isn't promoted well enough. Um, you know, each stop has got something, I'm sure, to offer. But, um, of course, the service, the, the service timetable doesn't allow much flexibility except for that trip that you mentioned there, Mark, but Nil could do a similar thing. There's as much to see in Nil as there is around the Horsham region. And um, I'm sure that we could organise something like that from here. It's still the same, certainly. Okay, thank you. Councillor Matt, do you have a view about the promotions? Uh, well, clearly um, Journey Beyond is, is a private company, but we, we do know this train has um, been subsidised um, for quite a while. And, and obviously there's a reason for that to keep it viable. Um, and I think the reason we're all here today is is because obviously government, um, well, the government on the South Australian side has got a bit of tired of doing that, which is a wrong decision. But um, we're all here coming up with ideas and um, sort of trying our best. There. And I suppose it's up to Journey Journey Beyond to listen to those things or for another provider to um, take its place and, and keep it viable because we know it can be um, and it does need some work, but we're here to do it. Okay, thank you, Matt. Uh, John, did you have put your hand up there? Now, in my book, I've looked at this, and I'm going to read out the, the relevant part, is that Macquarie Bank and Serco had a significant holding in the formation of Great Southern Railway, and it had seen some changes of ownership over the years, and in the past, Macquarie Bank and Serco have had significant holdings. It is presently owned by a private equity fund, Allegro Funds, through a subsidiary quarant, Journey Beyond is naturally a business to generate a profit for the investors. The Allegro current website proudly advises that it has transformed a transport provider to a customer-focused experiential tourism business and 80% plus of numbers travelling are in high-value tourism products in 2007 as compared to 40% in 2012. In other words, it has developed its business around a high value product and it logically follows that the relatively low cost overland product has had an uncomfortable existence within its portfolio. Okay. All right, thank you, John. Sean, do you have another question there, mate? Um, yeah, I guess interested in knowing what some of the panelists think. Whose responsibility is it really to fund this? I understand um, South Australian government is saying you know, it's a private company. So really, is, is it up to Journey Beyond to find a viable way to run this, or do you think that you know the governments should um, should, should keep funding it? Okay, uh, Professor Philip, do you have a view on this? Oh. The Commonwealth should be approached for some support. Um, secondly, um, if new rolling stock is required uh, in due course. There's the option of tilt trains, which successfully operate in Queensland. You don't need an electric tilt train. You could have a diesel tilt train. So, so that's, that's all I can... Oh, third point um, yeah. about the tourism. Kiwi Rail in New Zealand, with its three scenic trains, you can have a break of journey at no extra cost. And these places to stop at include in the North Island, the Chateau Tongariro at National Park, take two days, uh, or uh, Kaikoura, whale watching between Picton and Christchurch, or Arthur's Pass in the mountains, or Lake Bruna. 
uh, between Christchurch and Greymouth. And, uh, it, you know, they can see the value in Kiwi Rail of helping, you know, regional tourism. And I don't think it's been exploited properly here. Uh, thank you, Philip. Uh, Claire, did you have a comment about that? Thank you. Um, look, I think there is... Uh, it, the state Labor government previously provided the roughly $300,000 per year to assist in keeping this service going. And I think there is a role for governments in uh, supporting tourism, particularly regional tourism, and in providing a service. Uh, in, as I mentioned, in regional areas in particular, we get very little in the way of uh, public transport services. So it's not unreasonable for a relatively small amount of money to be provided to ensure that those services do continue. So I think it's fair to say that government does have some role in it. Okay, thank you. Um, Tony, can you, we can't see you, Tony, but can you, if you're still online, can you, do you have any comments about the funding side of things? S certainly, Mark. And for, look, all four parties have a shared responsibility. That is journey beyond the federal government and the two state governments. But can I just point this out? The federal government is now investing significant funds into inland rail systems across the country. They won't operate the system after it's been invested and established. The same applies to this. The fact that it is an existing service should in no way diminish the responsibility of governments in trying to get the service up and running, just as we're trying to do in other parts of Australia. That's good. Thank you very much. Sean, do you have another question? Last one, Mark. I'm just um, one. wondering why some of the key parties um, weren't, I'm sure they were invited. What's the reason that they might have given you for not being a part of this? I mean, it's um, great to have a chat about it, but when you haven't got the Victorian or South Australian government or Jenny Beyond, just wondering what's going to come out of this if, if they're not even a part of it. So, yeah, why weren't they involved? What was their reason? Yeah, so certainly we did send the invitations uh, out pretty widely. And, uh, um, but uh, the panel we've got is the panel we've got. And the, the part, of the, part of the purpose of today is to, uh, is to record this so we actually can use it as part of advocacy. So what's, what's being said today uh, will be sent to all those um, um, people in decision-making positions, whether they be state, federal or government, and that'll be part of the ongoing, on the, uh, part of the ongoing advocacy. Uh, John, I saw you put your hand up. Um, I've been communicating with the government through my local member, Richard Harvey, who's the member for Newland, and he has been passing material on to the Premier, and there was a chance that the Premier could have joined this, partic participated in this forum today, but he was at another function. I, I think they're listening to us. Now, regarding Journey Beyond, they've... They've been very hard to get any communication through. They have acknowledged that this summit is happening, but they haven't offered any contribution and other than saying that they've been in discussion with the Victorian government and that's where it is. Thank you, John. Uh, Margaret's got a hand up, and then we're going to uh, then I'll go to Matt, and then then we're going to wrap it up. So, Margaret, thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to say that I believe that um, I don't know that any rail is running um, for a profit. I don't think that's the purpose of the uh, of, of rail. I think it is a community. The community deserves to have rail, especially in regional areas, to um, to to connect us. And I think that each government, every government at all levels, has a responsibility to to ensure we have that. That's it. Thanks, Mark. I will will give Mike the opportunity to say something else. So, Matt, your closing comment, please. I mean, I think I think this event has actually been a brilliant. Um, in the short time, it's been muted to get to get to where we are now. Um, although we couldn't be joined by the decision makers as such, um, you can guarantee the fact that this has been fairly widely covered um, in the ABC and the local media right across um, through Adelaide, through to Melbourne, and all the little cities on the way in the, in the local papers. It's actually absolutely been worth it, um, and I can guarantee you that they would be listening because that this, these people here, these dedicated people on the panel we've got here, are putting the pressure on, and that's exactly what it's about. Okay, thank you, Matt and Mike. Couple yes, of words. Look, I'd like to thoroughly endorse Margaret's comments. Um, passenger rail is not intended to make a profit; it's meant to provide a service, and. Anyone who uh, thinks that oh, we're going to go into this venture to make lots and lots of money is in, in a dreamland. But 
it provides a service to us people and forget the profit side of it because that's just not a reality the reality is providing a service now whether that's in a a, a, a sole government role or a public private partnership or whatever whatever manifestation the fact remains the service is what's important not the monetary return thank you mike so john over to you for your final remarks please okay i just had to unmute this set me thinking that railways throughout the world have been great nation builders think england think stevenson and his rocket then there was the meeting of the union pacific and the central pacific railroads at promontory point thus joining the east and west coasts of usa Concerning Australia, there were three iconic trains that passed into corporate hands when the Commonwealth disposed of its railway assets in 1997. There was the Indian Pacific, officially 50 years old this year, when it was new, the railway workers called it Flash Harry, the McGann, which was in business for nearly 100 years, and lastly, our poor old Overland, which is 133 years old. She was once known to the drivers on the old Victorian railways as the grand old lady of the West. And I thank Mike for drawing to that, that to my attention because I hadn't previously known that and I've spoken to other railway historians and they hadn't known it either. But I think it's delightful because as such, she was one of the few named trains in Australia affectionately referred to in the feminine. In recent times, she has languished in the shadow of Flash Harry and McGann. It is worth contemplating a solitary South Australian Premier John Downer standing on the platform of the Adelaide Railway Station, watching the arrival of the first Intercolonial Express in 1887. While he didn't know it at that time, he had, along with James Service, Premier of Victoria, started the slow train ride to Federation. The Overland should be a national treasure. Okay. All right. Thank you very much, John, for your thoughts. And uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. We are going to stay a little bit uh, on a little bit longer to answer some of these questions, but I'd just like to publicly say unofficially to all of our panellists, thank you for your time and your commitment for sharing with us today. Mm -hmm.